Greetings and welcome to Writers on Writing. I am your host, Dr. Brenda Green, and this program is coming to you and paid for by Megger Evers College. Writers on Writing comes to you each Sunday and gives you, our listening audience, an opportunity to hear writers from the African diaspora talk about their work, their craft, and their lives. And I'm very, very pleased to have with me today, Kia Cawthron. Welcome, Kia. Thank, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, we are pleased to have you and we're pleased to talk about your riveting book, your historical narrative and novel. But I first want to share some information with our listening audience about you. So uh, Kia Cawthron is a playwright and novelist. Her debut novel, The Castle Cross the Magna Carta was published by Seven Story, Stories Press and was named a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice. It was also awarded the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. Her second novel, Moon and the Mars, is the one we will be discussing, and it was published in August 2021. Kia Cawthron is the author of numerous plays which have been produced in New York across the United States and internationally. Awards for her body of work for the stage include the Winham Campbell Prize for Drama, the Horton Foote Prize, the Flora Roberts, Roberts Award, the United States Artist James Adams Fellowship, the Otto Award for Political Theater, oh, can go on and on, the Simon Great Plains Playwright Award. She's also written a little for television, uh, David Simon's The Wire, uh, which um, had an outstanding, outstanding series award, and Tom Fontana's The Jury. She also um, teaches writing to incarcerated youth and adults and has taught um, death row exonerees, veterans, the chronically ill, university students, and others. And she also had a travel-related uh, retreat, I guess, a residency in Liberia uh, when it was transitioning out of its civil war. So you just have so much um, background and your novel, Moon on Mars, really reflects that. And um, as I was reading it, um, it, it took time. It's a long novel, but it just gave so much information. Yes, yes, yes. So much information on the history of New York City in the 1850s. So I'd like you to begin um, by telling us um, a little bit about your, your motivation for writing this novel. Um, I was really interested in uh, the relationship between Blacks and Irish in uh, New York City's Five Points District, which is the poorest district of New York. Uh, in the middle of the 19th century. And the book leads into the Civil War. It's over seven years. Um, for, for New Yorkers, it's that area sort of where the court buildings are in Manhattan now. So- African um, burial grounds, right? Around that area? It's near, the nearby, yes. yes. Um, yes. So, uh, so yeah, I was really interested in exploring those relationships. The, um, the two most, sort of, or the, bottom of the rung of the uh, socioeconomic ladder, uh, Black people on the very bottom because you needed, um, for males to vote in the Black community, you needed property, um, which wasn't true for an, a new immigrant could come in and vote if they were European. Uh, so, um, but they uh, very much those communities struggled together there was a lot of exchange um in the dance halls and 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 the way i felt to really explore both communities was to have a character who was a product of both because there were all sorts of uh, connections those communities were made and there were lots of biracial children as a result of that so the main character is a little girl and, um she's seven at the beginning and uh, it goes till she's 13 and then an epilogue later and uh, her name is Theo, and she, her mother was Irish, her father was Black. 
she's an orphan, but she has a lot of family because she's uh, living between the tenement apartments of her black grandmother and her Irish grandmother. And she's also very close to her Irish aunt and her black aunt. You know, as you was talking about that, it reinforced how important community was and is that comes out of the African tradition. But of course, it traveled um, to this country. And when you had the people who were enslaved, it became even more important because you also tell of those who ended up escaping from the South and landing in New York. You talk about the relationships of the Blacks who were there, who were free. Talk a little bit about what that period was like during the 1850s. And uh, you, you, you briefly mentioned it, but I'm thinking about something like Seneca Village and what happened, you know, the, the early origins of Central Park. If you can share with our audience, give them an image, a picture of what life was like then. Yeah, well, first of all, it was very busy in, in lower Manhattan. Um, there are a, a few photographs from that time. And uh, for example, uh, there are a couple of times when Theo gets on the ferry to go to Brooklyn. Brooklyn was a different city then. And the traffic was just kind of like today, except instead of being uh, cars, it was, you know, horse and buggy and, you know, other horses and, and uh, uh, a goat cart or something. So it was like still crazy traffic. Um, so Seneca Village was further uptown in the West 80s, um, a long walk, but Theo did it to see her aunt. And Seneca Village was, it was also a, um, uh, a mixed community, uh, multi-ethnic. Um, at that time, so Irish were the probably I, at that time, the, the largest immigrant population, but, but the second largest was Germans. So, um, so in Seneca village, there were Irish, there were Germans, but black people were the ones who had sort of, it was the land was sold to them decades before. So they were for the most part, like the gentry, the land owners right? and yes. Um, and, but it was again, I uh, like Seneca village. It was, um, a very friendly cooperative community, but it was destroyed under an eminent domain to make Central Park. Um, and it's, and people were forced out, people, you know, they didn't want to leave. And I think it's really important because New Yorkers, you know, most New Yorkers love Central Park. I love Central Park. It didn't have to be Central Park because there were different plans and one was to have it more East. Um, they were exactly where it would be. Um, but the final decision was that it would not destroy the mansions along Fifth Avenue. Instead, it became, uh, sort of became their front yard. So their, um, property values just went through the roof, um, and it destroyed, uh, poorer people and, um, and, uh, Black people who were not poor, you know, as I said, they were the land loaners and it destroyed uh, their land. So, um, and I specifically decided to set the book, I mean, to start the, the book in 1857, because I wanted to include Seneca Village. That was the last year that it existed. Um, that's a nice, yeah, I was saying that's a nice segue to my next question about your research process, because the book is full of so many details. It's almost like reading historical book I can see it paired with other books, you know, 1619, um, you know, or Mercy, Toni Morrison. I, I just, it is so rich and it gives really a history of the development of, of what led up to the Civil War. So, so share with us what your research process was because it's so detailed. You know, I, get, I can see the images of the, the young, the newsboys in the street, you know, giving the news and, and the mm -hmm. war. That, that seemed very, very comprehensive. And you're a playwright, you're not an historian, but you captured <laughs> all of that. Well, um, because I'm a playwright, you know, there's there are plenty of novels that very legitimately don't have 
dialogue. You know, they tell the story, the narrative. Because I'm a playwright, the dialogue was really important. And in some ways, it's 100% by dialogue because it's written in first person. So, um, uh, yeah, but I was just fascinated by the time. So I was very happy to sort of dig into to this story. But the story is like leading into and through the first couple of years, the Civil War. So it was really important for the um, for readers uh, to understand what was going on and me as I'm doing the research. So in and, and how it complete affected this family as it affected all Americans at that time. So um, so, yeah, there I have real newspaper articles. Um, Copyright began in 1926, so I can have them in, in the 19th century and not worry about, about paying thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, I have the newsboys. Uh, and yes, these are ways to sort of, uh, as the family's living history, to also tell history. Um, in one chapter, actually a couple of chapters, one in particular, um, I also bring up a lot of songs because it's really interesting, the history of song. And uh, for example, um, when Johnny Comes Marching Home, which was a, a, a Civil War song, was originally a drinking song, a, a bar song, and then yeah. it was transformed to that. So that's also interesting to me. And um, uh, yeah, no, it goes back to from from this north to the south and back again. You, you're continuing to show the intermingling and the pairing. Yes, yes, and um, uh, Dixie. Interestingly, that that was a really interesting song uh, because we very much think of it as the South, but it was it started in New York from somebody who wrote it. In New York, that's when it became popular. Um, a white man in New York, sort of pining for the South memory, but there were a couple of black men. This man used to live in Ohio, who said they did the tune first, and he stole it from them. But of course, people believe this white man. So that song is really interesting. <laughs> um, uh, oh, your question earlier about um, slavery and that connection with the book. So. So the book starts in 1857, slavery in New York um, ha uh, was, the abolition happened in 30 years before in 1827. Um, but Theo's grandmother and her great-grandmother who are still living had been enslaved. Her great-grandmother till her 50s and her grandmother, I think until her late 20s, um, her aunt, her black aunt was never uh, enslaved. So um, I, so she has that close to her, but also early in the book, um, a young woman who escaped slavery from the deep South comes to stay with the family and poses as Theo's aunt. Um, and there also is one other chapter uh, when I, she actually meets a young enslaved girl who a, a child around her own age who was brought up from the South. Um, and it's a dangerous time because the Fugitive Slave Act started in 1857. So uh, crossing the border did not protect people. They could be driven, dr um, you know, dragged right back. And frankly, some of them are. <laughs> yes. And frankly, people born free, if they didn't have the papers at the time, it could be their word against. Um, the the white people that are trying you know enslaving them as um 12 years of slave tells that story so. well you are you know you're as i said you're a playwright and you and the dialogue is so rich um i'd like you to comment a little bit on how you what your process is for writing and how you really capture the dialogue you have so many of the dialects that are captured mm -hmm. in the book and, and what is the process that you use um, in general when you're writing? Well, I'll say I, I am very good with child's children's voices. So a lot of people were, uh, you know, rather in, impressed with that. But that, that actually just happens to be something that I'm, that I'm good with. Um, the challenge was with this book was sometimes, uh, especially when Theo was younger, um, uh, having 
that the reader will understand some things that Theo doesn't necessarily understand. So that was the challenge, but, but, um, but I, but I did that a few times. Um, I, I definitely wanted to be careful about the, um, Auntie Miriam, the formerly enslaved uh, woman, because I didn't want to be cliche about that. And I was especially terrified about the Irish voices uh, because, I mean, I think, you know, I'm not accent. I'm writing a particular dialect to hopefully remind readers of the accent so then they can fill in the accent. So I was trying to find some um, <clears throat> tricks in syntax to, um, for I uh, to to have those reminders for the reader. So one in particular, I found a, a few little rules, but one in particular uh, really helped me. Uh, so first of all, Irish is a language. Um, it some people when you say the Irish language, they want to correct you and say the Gaelic language. Gaelic is not a language. Gaelic is an umbrella of several languages, Irish being one of them. So you could say the Irish language or Irish Gaelic but you wouldn't just say Gaelic. So, um, so in the Irish language, after was um, an auxiliary verb for the past te tense. And they then, that became translated into the, um, the colonialist language, English. So in Irish, you could say, or Irish English, you could say, um, I, I went to the bookstore. You would say, you could say, I'm off for going to the bookstore. Uh, I just went to the bookstore. I'm only after going to the bookstore. So that little trick sort of helped me to um, to navigate and, and swim in those waters of that language. It was still scary, but I could jump in after that. <laughs> so you have that kind of history and those uh, multiple voices. Um, what I'm, I'm going to go back to your process. So do you, when you're writing, do you sit by yourself and write? Do you, are you reading and writing? Are you in a, a writing group? What is your process and, and how do you um, help to val validate? How did you help to validate all of this was happening? Because again, this is, this is history and it involves uh, so many different languages and people was there a process you used or did you just rely on your own desire to tell this story and to do your research from the perspective that you had? I always I always write on my own. Nobody else sees um, what I've written until I have a complete draft. So, um, so yeah, I always do write on my own. I love writing residencies. I'd love to just go off someplace and totally focus, um, especially towards the end of this book. Um, uh, and then after I got out and any subsequent drafts, I was home in New York because it was a pandemic. So I couldn't, I couldn't go anyplace. But um, yeah, the, the time by myself and uh, I had my online etymology dictionary. So I'll know what words were not invented yet at that time. Um, uh, oh, I loved going to, um, a site um, with the, uh, the a Library of Congress because there were old New York papers there. And also I've got the New York Times site for old New York Times papers. There were over, by the way, over a hundred, it may even been 200, but definitely over 100 newspapers in New York at that time. And most, the vast majority of people read, that's how they got their news. And, and so- cut across, class, cut across class and race. I found that really interesting Yeah. Um, also. Yeah, and very motivating, you know, because we don't get that part of the history when we think about blacks and uh, during that time. Yeah, everyone was reading, and they were reading all kinds of books. So just going, just continuing along I that just, line. I just want to say, I just want to say one thing that that because most uh, literature about this about slavery, people is the South takes place in the South. An important thing in New York, it was it was never illegal for an enslaved person to read. And sometimes for the uh, the master, it was actually um, prestigious for literate slaves. They could be their bookkeepers. So yeah, it's a much different than most people think of slavery in the North was very different. So is there any particular highlight that you had in, in writing this? A hi highlight? A highlight. Is there any 
particular moment or chapter or that you found really, really riveting? Oh. What was the highlight for you? So many, so many. <laughs> um, I could throw out a bunch of them. I'll throw out one. I'll, I'll just try to throw out some that maybe people don't know because I, I learned so much when I read it. There was this amazing museum in, in, in downtown New York, Barnum's American yes. Museum. Which, <laughs> I love the way you captured that. Oh. Yes. So this is before he went into the circus business. He didn't do that till he was 60 years old, the circuses. So as a younger man, um, everything was in there. There was like a zoo. There was, there were all sorts of performers. There were just, um, there were stuffed, there were animals dead and alive stuffed from like all around the world. Um, and there were most famously his, um, uh, I think he called them living oddities, um, which were what we think of, uh, you know, the bearded lady and, and this and that. Tom Thumb. Tom Thumb. And, and yes. it's exactly, I was going to talk about Tom Thumb because it's really important, I think, for people to know, because, and this also goes a little bit to me writing a bit about disability. One of her, Theo's cousins, actually one of her Irish cousins, um, is paralyzed from the, the waist down. So, so there is issues of that that are addressed in the book and also in this museum. I mean, it's important to distinguish between, um, you know, the the uh, armless man who could, you know, do you know, cut out um, valentines with his toes, um, which were very skillful, and I was very skillful. Um, or, but let's say. Uh, Actually, that's not the best example. The um, the there was a family of um, the 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 giant family. Yes, okay. I remember that. So, yes, yes. So they're there just to be gawked at, right? Now, now I will say that at that time, if there was no other way to make a living, that's you know what they had to do to make a living, but that you know, is a certain thing that's offensive in a way that Tom Thumb is not because Tom Thumb was a performer. He was just an incredible performer who just happened to be small. So he was a showman. That's what he was. As a matter of fact, um, I, I mentioned it in the epilogue because this happened later at some point. I mean, he got rich yes. um, and, and his wife, Lavinia, who gets married as part of in the book. Um, there's a point where uh, P.T. Barnum is having financial troubles and, um, and Tom Thumb loans him some money later. So, yeah. So, you know, part of what I think about is as a writer that you writers um, are in conversation with other writers. When I say that, you know, kind of in a broader sense and also in conversation with what's going on um, sometimes in the Times. So if you had to think about writers or um, novelists, playwrights, poets, who are you in conversation with? Yeah, well, it's 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 funny because people behind you that I see, Toni Morrison, um, you know, oh my gosh, I'm going to go blank on her name right now. Um, she wrote that fantastic book that won the National Book Award, the Katrina book. And then she also wrote the... Um, Oh my gosh, she feels stupid that I'm going blank on her name. Um, the, the yellow, the, about the yellow house? No, she, no, no, no. What was it? Oh my gosh. Um, she she wrote a book about men that we read, that I read. Do you know what I'm who I'm talking about? And I'm going blank on her name. And then she wrote that amazing Katrina book. I absolutely love her writing. Those two books are amazing. And Forgive me, wonderful writer, that I'm going blank on your name right now. Um, I, yes, I, I over the pandemic, I read Shuggy Bain, wonderful book from a writer uh, out of Scotland who lives in New York now. Um, uh, a book called Barn Eight, uh, which was about these uh, radical vegans <laughs> like free the chickens on this uh corporate farm in theater there's um a wonderful writer from uh ba back in the 60s she wrote a book called funny house of a negro her name is adrian kennedy yeah. um she's still living 
and um, a surrealist from that time in the early days of La Mama, which was this legendary uh, experimental theater house. So yeah, a lot of people. <laughs> you, you are working with so many different audiences in, in your playwriting and in your writing. What message do you have for the playwright or the writer? Uh, the emerging writer, the playwright. Yes, I. two things which are related. One is write what your heart is telling you to write. And the second thing is when it is time to show it to people, um, with what you want, show it to people that you really respect um, and take what's useful and throw the rest away. As a playwright, we also have the experience of having a reading and then having a talk back, which with the audience, which many playwrights really just do not like at all. They just read them. I, I did not, I did not hate them. Um, most of them I'm fine with. And at the same time, with most of them, 95% of what people say is not useful, but I'm very polite and thank them, gracious because the 5% that is use useful, I'm so happy I got. So, yeah. Okay. And your next project? Um, I'm, you know, working, I'm, sharing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on a play that, um, with two different plays, one that will be produced in the fall and one next fall, um, that uh, this one has to do with an organization that uh, formerly incarcerated persons. I should say my novels are usually contemporary. Except the other novel is not. I mean, I'm sorry. The, I'm sorry. My plays are usually contemporary, okay, right? But the other play is not. It's actually. It's going to be. So that pl play should be in New York this fall. The other play will be in D.C. a year later, um, and it has to do with a legendary teacher who was born into slavery. Her name is um, Anna Julia Cooper. She is the only woman on your passport, quoted on your passport. And um, she was just amazing, amazing, brilliant teacher. Um, around the turn of the century, when there was a lot of controversy, there was always a lot of controversy in black education. But at that time, it was very much of, uh, should black people have classical education and go you know, to be doctors and lawyers, or should they just go you know, be taught trades um and this had a lot to do with white donors and their opinions and the power that they wielded so well i really want to thank you for sharing uh your story for writing moon moon and the moon on mars moon and the mars moon and the mars <laughs> moon and the mars and you'll find out about moon and the mars because akia does a nice um has a nice story about the real why she chose to write and call it Moon and the Mars. It is really showing the real complexity of race relations in, in 19th century New York City. And I want to thank you for writing it. And I wanna encourage our listening audience to go out and purchase the Moon, Moon and the Mars, Moon and the Mars by Kia Cawthron. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing your, your next project, your next play. Um, remember, the writer is always reading, the reader is always writing. Keep reading and writing and empower yourselves as readers and writers. Write me at writers at mbc.cuny.edu. And thank you again, Kia. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Thank you for all of your work. It's, uh, you are really embodying the life of the writer in my mind.